It's 6 p.m. on a Thursday here in Korea. Welcome to our newscast. I'm Daniel Che. Let's begin with the headlines. South Korea's military continues to monitor the situation after the North fired six short-range projectiles into the East Sea this morning. Not a surprising outburst by the regime over newly adopted UN sanctions and the upcoming Seoul-Washington defense drills. Following the UN's passage of a new sanctions resolution on North Korea, President Park Geun-hye expressed his hope that the move will motivate Pyongyang to change its ways, while the U.S. and the EU are eager to impose additional punitive measures against the regime. And at the UN Human Rights Council, South Korea's foreign minister reminds the international community that more must be done to improve the human rights situations in North Korea for the people there, while outlining Seoul's newly adopted law on the matter. North Korea fired off several short-range projectiles this morning, just a few hours after the UN adopted the strongest sanctions yet against the regime for its recent string of provocations. Kim Hyun-bin starts us off with Pyongyang's breakneck display of defiance against the international community. The South Korean military was on high alert after North Korea fired six short-range projectiles from its port city of Wonsan in Gangwon province on Thursday morning. The projectiles flew for between 100 to 150 kilometers before splashing down into the East Sea. North Korea fired several short-range projectiles into the East Sea at 10 a.m. on Thursday. Our forces continue to monitor the situation, and we are ready for any provocations. This is the first time the North has fired projectiles this year, and South Korea's defense ministry said it believes it was done in protest against a new UN sanctions resolution that had passed just hours beforehand. The ministry said it hasn't yet determined whether the projectiles were short-range missiles or artillery fire, but it is looking to see if they were fired from a mobile missile launcher or from a newly developed 300-millimeter multiple rocket launcher. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said it will counter any provocations from the North and warned that reckless provocations could lead to the regime's collapse. The ministry is also monitoring the regime's key military facilities for possible signs of future provocations. Military officials say the North could conduct a short-range missile launch across the maritime border or send in unmanned area vehicles south of the border in the near future. The North's latest provocation comes ahead of a round of annual military drills between Seoul and Washington that start next week and are slated to be the largest ever this year. The U.S. is expected to deploy several pieces of strategic weaponry to the peninsula during the two-month-long exercise to warn Pyongyang that the regime will pay a price for its provocations. Kim Abin, Arirang News. The toughest sanctions against North Korea in two decades unanimously approved. Kwon Soa zooms in on the U.N. Security Council's latest move to punish Pyongyang, which comes nearly two months after the regime conducted its fourth nuclear test. 2270. That is the number of the new UN Security Council resolution, which embodies the strongest ever sanctions imposed on North Korea and took the longest time to be drafted. All 15 members of the council raised their hand for a yes vote at the UN Security Council headquarters in New York, 57 days after North Korea's fourth nuclear test on January 6th. Sanctions on the regime's first test back in 2006 were adopted in just five days. We thank the United States for having taken the initiative for this resolution and the People's Republic of China for having engaged in the lengthy consultations as well as all other members of the Security Council. This resolution represents a seismic shift in the way the Council approaches DPRK proliferation concerns. It recognizes at its core that in order to prevent the DPRK from continuing to advance its nuclear weapons program, the international community has to be prepared to sanction sectors beyond those directly related to the nuclear weapons program or their ballistic missile program. The gravity of the growing problem regarding North Korea's continuous violations and the ineffectiveness of existing resolutions is what led to the South Korea-based, U.S.-drafted and China-backed tightening of sanctions. They include mandatory cargo inspections, a ban on the trade of coal, iron and titanium, and an expansion of bans on weapons and luxury items. 
They also target the banking and financial sector and blacklist individuals and entities linked to Pyongyang's weapons programs with travel bans and asset freezes. South Korea's foreign ministry welcomed the adoption, putting great emphasis on diplomatic efforts to ensure the sanctions are effectively implemented. The government will do all its efforts to cooperate with UN members for a smooth implementation of the resolution and it will enforce international cooperation for North Korea to give up its nuclear program completely, verifiably and irreversibly. As UN members have to submit a report within three months on how they plan to implement the new sanctions, the first meeting on the matter was held with 13 government branches at Seoul's foreign ministry on Thursday. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Welcoming the adoption of new UN sanctions on North Korea, President Park Geun-hye has expressed her hope that Pyongyang will eventually change its ways. In a message delivered by her press secretary on Thursday, she said the adoption of an unprecedented resolution in North Korea is a strong message from the international community for peace on the Korean Peninsula and the world. President Park showed her appreciation to UN Security Council members and the international community for their efforts securing sanctions aimed at getting the regime to give up its nuclear weapons. She went on to emphasize South Korea sincerely wants the North to take the path to change, adding that Seoul will continue to strive for the reunification of the two Koreas. The United States is ramping up the pressure on the North by blacklisting key North Korean figures and entities under its own sanctions. The European Union is also mulling raising the bar on punitive measures against Pyongyang. Park Jong-hong tells us more. With the new UN sanctions now adopted, the United States is taking the matter further into its own hands by implementing unilateral sanctions on North Korea. Key North Korean figures and entities have been singled out and put on its blacklist. They are top aides to Kim Jong-un and the regime's powerful National Defense Commission. The commission was among the list of individuals and entities included on the U.S. sanctions list. The other key entities include the Academy of National Defense Science, the Ministry of Atomic Energy Industry, the National Aerospace Development Administration, and the Central Military Commission of the Workers' Party of Korea. Individuals on the blacklist include Hwang byung so who is a vice chairman of the National Defense Commission, a member of the Central Military Commission, and a director of the Political Bureau, among other roles. Defense Minister Park Yong-sik and two other vice chairmen of the Defense Commission were also blacklisted. Taking its own action, the European Union is considering imposing additional sanctions on North Korea. Federica Mogherini, the EU's foreign policy chief, added that Pyongyang's actions were, quote, a grave threat to international peace and security in the region and beyond. In the wake of the adoption of the UN resolution, the European Union and major European countries welcomed the measures, urging Pyongyang to cease its nuclear and missile development. Germany's foreign ministry said the resolution sent an important signal to the leadership in Pyongyang that provocations will not be tolerated. Park Jong-hong, Arirang News. With the spotlight already on North Korea shedding light on the regime's dire human rights, abuse seems to be the next step. South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se has already gotten a jump on that with an impassioned appeal. Connie Kim has the details. The international community must gather its efforts to improve the North Korean people's human rights. That was the message voiced by South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se at the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. Even as the international community is sparing no efforts to promote human rights and humanitarianism, we have in our midst a human rights black hole, namely DPRK. Using the podium to remind the world that people in North Korea are suffering as a result of the regime's focus on its weapons development programs, Minister Yoon said now is the time for the international community to improve the human rights situation in the North. South Korea's contribution to that effort is a new law on North Korean human rights that passed Wednesday after 11 years. Under the new law, the government will devise a three-year plan for improving the human rights situation in North Korea.
Part of that will involve carrying out investigations into the matter, setting up an advisory committee and launching an archival center. Pyongyang's human rights abuses were thrown into the spotlight in 2014 when the UN Commission of Inquiry on North Korea released a landmark report detailing the abuses in the regime. It seems North Korea may already be feeling the pressure from these and other efforts to raise awareness about its human rights record. Earlier this week, North Korean Foreign Minister Ri Su-yong said the regime would boycott future meetings of the UN Human Rights Council. North Korea is expected to face continued pressure from the international community, both through the actions of the Human Rights Council and the sanctions recently adopted by the Security Council. Connie Kim, Arirang News. President Bakune held a summit talks with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi on Thursday. Discussions centered on expanding bilateral economic cooperation with a focus on Seoul's participation in Cairo's large-scale projects. Song ji Sun fills us in. President Park Geun-hye sat down with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, who is in Seoul for a three-day visit. And the two leaders discussed ways to expand bilateral cooperation on economic and regional issues. Seoul and Cairo both aim to expand bilateral trade volume, which hovers at just over 2 billion U.S. dollars. Egypt's growth remained in a 2 percent range after the unrest sparked by the Middle East democratization movement in 2011, also known as the Arab Spring Revolution, but the World Bank forecast it to double to the 4 percent range by 2015. Egypt has since aggressively launched large-scale projects to boost its economy, and is seeking greater participation and investment from Korean companies. President Park and her Egyptian counterpart signed nine MOUs on Thursday to support such initiative across diverse sectors, including trade, finance, legal and education. Seoul is to take part in setting up Cairo's public transportation infrastructure, such as subway and railway systems, as well as desalination projects that amounts to some 3.4 billion U.S. dollars. Korea will also review taking part in building renewable energy plants like solar panel and nuclear reactors and seek to remove obstacles for Korean companies entering Egypt, like difficulties in acquiring work permits in the country. Song ji Arirang News. Just when we thought the worst has passed at Korea's domestic politics, another battle is brewing in the National Assembly, with the ruling Senri party calling on the opposition to pass new cyber terrorism legislation before the session ends next week. This as the opposition continued to lodge its objections to a new anti-terrorism law that was the subject of the filibuster it brought to an end earlier this week. For the latest, we turn to our Jim young gil the ruling Senate party said Thursday now that South Korea has a counterterrorism law, it's time for parliament to pass legislation on countering cyber attacks from North Korea. North Korea's cyber attacks are another big threat to South Korea's national security. Therefore, the cyber terrorism bill must also be passed as soon as possible. We ask for the opposition's cooperation. Pyongyang launched a cyber attack on Seoul in July 2009, two months after its second nuclear test, and hacked South Korean media outlets in March 2013, a month after its third nuclear test. Meanwhile, the ruling party hailed the passage of the counterterrorism law, which went through after the main opposition party ended its nine-day filibuster against the legislation. Under the new law, a control tower for the government's anti-terrorism measures will be set up under the prime minister's office. The National Intelligence Service will then be allowed to collect information on terror suspects, including private communications, travel and financial transactions. The expansion of the spy agency's power was what drew the objections of the main opposition Minju Party of Korea, which criticized the ruling party for passing the legislation unilaterally after the opposition walked out of parliament in protest. The counterterrorism law was an act of terror on South Korean citizens' basic rights and the Constitution, as it could infringe on people's human rights. President Park Geun-hye and the Senuri Party have chosen the spy agency over citizens' rights and democracy. With the battle for the counterterrorism bill over, the Senuri Party now hopes to push for passage of another contentious set of bills aimed at labor market reform. But there are two main concerns, that there is not much time before the current parliamentary session ends next Thursday, 
and that lawmakers' focus will soon turn to the general election in April. Kim Young-gi, Arirang News. Switching over to other stories now, consumer prices in February recovered from slower growth the month before, with the inflation rate back up in the 1% range. In particular, it seems fruit and vegetable prices have risen due to bad weather and a major holiday. Our Oh Soo Young has the numbers. Korea's consumer price growth saw a rebound last month, after tumbling into the 0% range in January. Statistics Korea data shows that February prices picked up 1.3% from the year before and 0.5% from the month earlier. The agency says the reason for the pickup was due to a drop in fresh food production because of the cold weather, coupled with higher demand before the Lunar New Year holiday. Prices of fresh foods including fish, clams, fruit and vegetables surged 9.7% from the year before, the biggest jump since January 2013. Services also became more expensive, especially rental fees, which climbed to a four-year high of 2.9 percent. The price increases in February exceeded expectations that the monthly inflation rate would hit between 0.9 to 1 percent. However, experts say the recent upsurge doesn't necessarily signal a positive outlook for the country's economic growth. The inflation rate inched closer to the Bank of Korea's target rate for this year, set at 2 percent. Still, both the consumer and corporate sentiment indices are showing negative outlooks for the economy. The recent surge in the inflation rate was mostly due to temporary factors like the weather and Lunar New Year. So it seems reaching the target inflation rate will take time. Consumer sentiment sank to an eight-month low in February, hitting 98 on the index. A reading below 100 indicates consumers are feeling pessimistic about the economy. Oh Young, Arirang News. The amount of loans extended to Korean firms grew at a slower pace in the fourth quarter last year. The Bank of Korea says corporate lending by banks and non-banking financial institutions stood at around 780 billion U.S. dollars as of the end of 2015. That's up roughly 9.5 billion from the end of September. That marks the smallest increase since the fourth quarter of 2014 and a huge slowdown from the $16 billion rise posted a quarter earlier. The central bank says lending lands lending late tends to slow down at the end of the year as companies seek to manage their debt while settling their accounts. China's biggest political event is called Lianghui or Two Sessions has kicked off in Beijing. The political advisory body called the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference convened on Thursday, while the country's legislature, the National People's Congress, will begin its session on Saturday. The annual event will gather more than 5,000 delegates and advisors from all corners of China over the course of 11 days to discuss and vote on major issues and legislation. Economists around the world will especially be looking forward to the opening of the NPC session on Saturday. Premier Li Keqiang is expected to announce the nation's GDP growth target for the year, which is expected to be somewhere between 6.5 and 7 percent. With that, we've come to the end of our newscast. As always, thank you for watching.